Um, yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Miriam Leinberger. I am uh, just recently moved from the Hero Center to, to Zurich. Um, I'm not usually working on uh, mental or bodily interference, but I'm usually currently working on a paper together with uh, Tom um, on the question what determines um, the magnitude or the severity of a mental interference. Um, and just a little disclaimer, this is very much work in progress. Um, so a lot of ideas are not um, you know, all worked out in detail, but this is why I'm also looking forward to um, any types of comments or ideas, how we can develop this further. Uh, so the, the general idea is that we, many people seem to agree that we might have something like a right, right against mental interference. And there are many open questions as to what this right exactly entails and how we should define this. And one other open question is um, what determines yeah, the severity or the magnitude of this um, interference. So it seems that certain types of interferences seem less severe. Um, Tom talked about this in the case of bodily interference. The same seems to be the case for mental interference. Like if I slightly enhance your mood for five minutes, that seems much less severe than if I would um, delete someone's memory um, forever. Um, so, uh, but there's like still open questions. How do we exactly pin down um, this, this severity? And we want to argue that um, three broad determinants um, are important here. Um, the first is the proportion of the mind affected. So the more, um, yeah, this, I think this is pretty straightforward. The, the more mental states that you alter with mental interference, the more severe is this interference. So if I um, just say I delete one of your memories versus all of your memories, um, that would be like the latter case would of course be a more severe intervention. The second determinant is the degree and duration of any change to those mental states. Um, again, I think this is also pretty straightforward. So if I change, say, your mood for a very long time and really strongly, this would be a more severe interference than if it's just uh, slightly and uh, shortly. And then the third determinant was um, that the importance of the mental states that are implicated um, is relevant for the severity of a mental interference. Um, so let's say if someone would change someone's deeply held religious beliefs, that seems more severe than if someone would change their belief that their tea got cold. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there seems to be something about um, some, some types of mental state that makes them more important, even if we hold the proportion and degree and duration of the change the same, um, these certain mental states are more important and lead to more um, severe mental interferences. And this is kind of where it gets tricky. So what determines this importance of the mental states? Um, and what we're looking at, or like what we're trying to do now in the paper is not to give a definitive answer to this question, but to raise some suggestions and um, also dis like discuss why they're plausible and also um, what, what problems with the different suggestions are. Um, and I just want to go over um, some of those suggestions and they are distinguished into, it is, uh, distinguished into um, subjective, intersubjective and objective uh, mental states. You, you, um, in the end, I will make an argument where <laughs> this distinction will be relevant. But for now, I'll just like go over a few of those suggestions. I will not have time to go into them in detail, but um, just motivate them briefly. Um, so the subjective determinants are meant to capture um, elements that determine the importance that are just based on the subject's views and, and um, yeah, the, the, the subjective uh, point of view of the individual that would be um, that would be suffering the mental infringement. Um, so one example there would be um, that strongly felt mental states would be particularly important. Um, so for example, someone's uh, strong desire or severe pain or um, extreme pleasure, that these would be candidates for particularly important mental states. Um, 
yeah, because because of the phenomenological impact they have, and also because of some downstream um, effects, they might be um, particularly important to the individual's overall mental and, and emotional landscape. Um, then another candidate to determine the importance of mental states on a subjective level would be the self-concept. So what um, an individual, but what would be important elements in an individual self-concept understood as kind of a cluster of the belief an individual, individual holds about themselves. So someone who believes um, that the fact that they're doing philosophy is very important to, do, to who they are, it's central to, to their identity, then the mental states um, relevant for this central element of their um, self-concept would be particularly important and would mean that uh, interfering with them would be particularly severe. Um, and then a similar case can be made for a narrative identity. So what is important for you in terms of your narrative identity, of your life history, of where you take yourself to be and to go to um, in your life. Um, so important elements there are, central elements there are important mental states um, whose infringement would be particularly severe. Um, in terms of intersubjective determinants, uh, one candidate would be that mental states which are considered as um, particularly important in a certain culture or society um, carry more importance. So that means, say, a case in which a person um, is within a culture who uh, has for, for whom and, and within sorry within this culture this mental state is connected to some religious beliefs for example or to some important cultural rituals and then infringing this mental state of the person that is within that culture does seem more severe than um, infringing the same mental states in a person who's not embedded in this type of uh, culture or society and in a similar way we can argue for um, the in, uh, interferences with mental states that are important for uh, significant others. So if your circle of friends is built around um, an interest in a certain activity and you um, interfere with that activity, that might seem more severe than the case of a person who is not embedded in this kind of relations that ascribe importance to these mental states. And then to the objective determinants. So one um, potential candidate for a determinant of importance of mental states are um, the number of connections a mental state has to other mental states. So this is similar to how Google determines the importance of um, uh, internet or of websites um, by how well they are connected, how well they are linked to other sites. Um, similarly, we might think that mental states that are highly interconnected are more important. And there are some issues with this um, insofar as it's kind of hard to um, define the type of connections that is relevant. Are we talking about causal connections or logical connections? Um, and then we might think that um, some states that are highly interconnected might still seem a bit less relevant than, than others which are less collected, which are more specific. So say someone um, might have a slight preference for the color green, and this kind of filters in a lot of their perceptions and in a lot of their memories as well. They evaluate them according to this preference. So this preference seems highly interconnected. Um, and they also have a really strong uh, preference for for jazz music they might be let's say this person is a jazz music or musician um, and then like because this jazz music is is maybe um, a more specific case like the preference for jazz over blues say um, is a more specific type of of mental state it's more narrow more narrowly connected but we might still say this is more relevant this is more important it seems that in interfering with the person's preference for green might be a less severe interference than their preference for jazz. Um, another um, determinant 
for the importance of mental states would be um, hierarchy, hierarchy um, account. So here the idea is that some of our mental states seem to be hierarchically ordered. So you might think that um, a belief system is um, has some some order of hierarchy. So someone might believe in God is like high up in the hierarchy, and somewhere further down the line is to believe um, that God might listen to your prayers if you pray in a certain way, for example. So this this might seem like um, there is a certain hierarchy in beliefs and interfering with the beliefs that are higher up in the hierarchy, so to say, would seem a more severe interference. But again, this comes with some issues of how to define um, the hierarchy, what, what types of um, structures are we looking at? And also that um, not all mental states seem to be hierarchically structured. So it might only be applicable to a certain subset of mental states, such as beliefs, whereas um, in memories, this might be, for example, harder to, to apply. Um, another determinant for, for the importance of mental states could be connected to the idea of a real, deep, or true self. So there are some accounts in different debates that we have something like a true self or something that is more like deeply, deeply you. Um, and we might think that the mental states that are part of the true self or the real self are more important than others. Um, an issue with this is that the accounts that make such a distinction between like the, the true self or the real self and, and the rest of the self, they um, typically involve something like identification with those uh, parts of the self or um, um, an endorsement. So think of um, Frankfurt's second order volitions. And the, on the other hand, the importance of mental states seems to not depend on a certain endorsement or, or um, positive ev evaluation. So it seems that even um, rejected and negatively valued mental state can be highly important. Um, and then we have agency as a determinant. So the idea is that let's use an, an analogy to the, to the bodily case. Um, if you interfere with someone's hand and um, it doesn't interfere with the functions of the hand, this seems less severe than if you would interfere, let's say, with the, with the movement of someone's hand. And similarly, we might think um, interfering with the, with the mind in a way that impedes its agency, let's say, um, reasoning or perception um, is particularly severe. And finally, there's also um, possible determinants in terms of uh, well-being and harm. So, um, for example, how much a person's well-being de depends or normally depends on the persistence of a mental state um, might determine the importance of the mental state. Um, this has the implication that um, an interference that greatly benefits someone would also be very severe. Um, which can be counterintuitive, um, I think, in some cases. And the harm case is, is also similar. So how much an, a mental um, interference would harm a person um, if this is determining the importance of a, of a mental state and thereby the, the severity of an interference. And this would lead to the um, probably a bit uh, implausible conclusion that mental interference that are not harmful would not be um, severe at all, or so, or mental interference that are beneficial would not be severe at all. So these are just some suggestions that we want to kind of put out there. Um, and then we also want to make an argument that um, we need subjective, intersubjective, and objective determinants um, to get the full picture of the um, importance of mental states. So the idea for this argument is that um, subjectively important mental states, for example, these like strongly felt emotions or what's important for one's self-concept, they are important by the virtue that by the virtue of the fact that the individual themselves deem them important. So interfering with them, even though it doesn't really have um, a big impact on their lives, for example, it's not highly interconnected mental states, and so on. Um, would still be significant because the individual deems them significant. 
Um, and then the intersubjective dimensions um, also seem important to take into account because like as the, the example that I mentioned that a person um, who is in an intersubjective context who greatly values certain mental states um, would suffer uh, a more severe mental interference than one who would be in a context um, in which those mental states are not particularly valued. Um, but then we also have to say that both subjective and, inter and intersubjective determinants might not be the full picture. They might miss some important mental state or overstate the importance of others, um, which is why we need more objective measures to get the full pictures. Um, and therefore we need like all three of those. Um, we, there's some issues about like the terminology of subjective, intersubjective and objective, like whether um, if you make the intersubjective subjective group big enough, then it just becomes the, the objective. And some people argue that um, objectivity is just the sum of, of all the, um, like if we, con we consider all the um, intersubjective viewpoints, um, but to not get lost in this debate, I think the idea is that like a more specific, more narrow cultural and, and um, significant others context uh, would be relevant. Okay, so that's just some uh, pre preliminary ideas for this paper so far. So I'm curious to hear what you think of it and if you have any more ideas of what we should definitely consider or what didn't work at all. Um, yeah, it would be great to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam.